Hello and welcome to this broadcast bringing you news and views from Deloitte. My name is Robert Bruce and I'm a financial journalist. Joining me today to talk about the ISB's discussion paper on macro hedging is Kush Patel, a financial instrument specialist and director in Deloitte's UK IFRS Centre of Excellence. Before we begin, I'd like to stress that the views expressed in this broadcast are personal views and not necessarily the views of Deloitte. Kush, before we consider what's in this discussion paper, could you give us some background as to where it fits in with the ISB's overall financial instruments project? Sure. Well, the ISB's project to replace the current financial instrument standard, IS39, with the new standard, IFRS 9, is still ongoing. Now, big chunks of the project are complete and already included in the issued version of IFRS 9. So as a bit of a reminder, IFRS 9 was first issued with a classification measurement model for financial assets in 2009 and then had an amendment to it in 2010 to include the model for financial liabilities as well as carry over the derecognition model for IS39. And now more recently in November last year, the new general hedge accounting model was added. So now all that's left to do are some limited amendments to the classification model for assets and the inclusion of a new impairment model based on expected losses. So these final bits are due to be completed later in the year. However, when IFRS 9 is finished, it's not going to be a complete replacement to IS39. Now that's because IS39 includes a macro fair value hedging model for interest rate risk. That's where fixed interest rate exposures are adjusted for changes in fair value due to interest rate risk. Now this macro model in IS39 is separate to the general hedge accounting model and was designed to try and accommodate banks hedging of interest rate risk in portfolios of prepayable items. For example, prepayable mortgages where the measurement of the hedged item for changes in the hedge risk is more difficult because of the prepayment option. Now the objective of the macro model in IS39 is to try and replicate one-to-one -one hedging, but in a more operational way. But this is where the problem begins, because this begins to disconnect from risk management, which is much more sophisticated and complex than just one-to-one -one hedging. So given the complexities involved, the ISB separated its project to overall macro hedging from the general hedge accounting project. In fact, they separated it from the IFRS 9 project completely. Now this was to avoid delaying the completion of IFRS 9. This approach has allowed the ISB to take more time with the macro project and more fully consider different alternatives to try and address the issues more comprehensively. The ISB has also acknowledged that it would like to consider more than just interest rate risk hedging and also consider other dynamic risk management activities that takes place in other industries. For example, where other industries might hedge for FX risk or commodity price risk. However, since interest rate risk hedging is the scenario that's well known and it's covered in IS39, the discussion paper focuses on this as the base case. And it's from here they then request insights on how it might apply to other dynamic risk management activities. So there are questions here for non-financial corporates to consider. Given this discussion paper stage of the macro project, it's clear that we're still some way off the final replacement of the current model in IS39. So whilst this project is ongoing, adopters of IFRS 9 have the option to apply the macro model in IS39 with the IFRS 9 general model. Furthermore, those moving from IS39 to IFRS 9 also have the additional option to continue applying the full hedge accounting model in IS39. In other words, they can carry on doing both the general and macro model in IS39 with the rest of IFRS 9. This second alternative is really there to give those for whom dynamic risk management is relevant the ability to wait for the macro model to be complete before they change any of their hedge accounting. Why is macro hedging such a special case? And what are the specific issues with the, the macro model that already exists in IS39? It's a good question. Well, the core of the general hedge accounting model in IS39 and IFRS 9 is about designating specific hedged items with specific hedging instruments. And it's all there to overcome the measurement mismatches that otherwise arise between hedged items and hedging instruments being measured on a different basis. The general model allows an element of groups of items to be hedged, but this is suited to simple groups of items. In other words, closed or static groups of items that don't change for the term of the hedge. It doesn't work well for open, dynamic portfolios where the hedged items and hedging instruments constantly change. Now this is what the macro project is targeting. 
Now, I mentioned that the macro model in IS39 doesn't really address the point that portfolio hedging is different to one-to-one -one hedging because it doesn't take into account the portfolio behavior of the group of exposures. It just tries to recreate the one-to-one -one hedging. Now, this creates various difficulties. For example, when the portfolio of hedged items and hedging instruments changes, hedge accounting leads to frequent de-designations and redesignations, which makes things difficult operationally with tracking and amortizing hedge adjustments. This is a massive issue in practice. It can be a real headache for people trying to apply this. Also, it inevitably leads to p &L volatility from hedging effectiveness that doesn't really represent the economic position and doesn't reflect the dynamic risk management approach that's taken. Another downside is that hedge accounting requires selecting either fair value or cash flow hedge accounting, whereas truly neither in isolation portrays the actual dynamic risk management activity of net interest margin hedging, which is usually the objective of such a dynamic hedging strategy. Now, the stark differences between the mechanics for cash flow hedging, where derivative gains and losses are deferred in OCI, versus fair value hedging, where the hedged items are adjusted through P&L, can really get in the way of comparability for entities that essentially are doing the same risk management. Another issue to mention with the general model is that it has restrictions around what exposures are eligible for hedge accounting. Often, the restrictions only consider the exposures at the individual level and don't think about it from a portfolio level perspective. For example, IS39 doesn't allow deposits, which can be withdrawn without notice, i.e. demand deposits, to be fair value hedged for interest rate risk. And that's because they deem the fair value not to be less than the demandable amount. Whereas in practice, the core of a portfolio of demand deposits, which is expected to remain stable for a set number of years, is deemed to expose a bank to interest rate risk, and hence is hedged. So in the end, trying to extend the one-to-one -one hedging model to dynamic portfolio hedges just means that the outcome is less transparent, less meaningful, and more of an operational headache. So that's why the ISB has considered an alternative approach in its discussion paper. OK, so how is what the ISB considers in its discussion paper different to the IS39 macro hedge accounting model for interest rate risk? Well, the basic idea is still there and that's to address the measurement issues that arises from measuring the hedging instrument, such as derivatives, at fair value through P&L, whilst measuring the underlying hedged items on a different basis, such as amortised cost. However, what's different about the model is that it doesn't hinge on a hedge accounting designation. Instead, it's a revaluation model that's applied to the whole portfolio of exposures that are hedged for interest rate risk. Under the approach, the whole portfolio of exposures is re-measured for changes in interest rate risk. So you take the expected cash flows of the portfolio and discount them by the managed interest rate, for example, three month LIBOR. It's not a full fair value measure because it's only re-measured for interest rate risk. A bit like fair value hedge adjustments for interest rate risk when you're doing hedge, fair value hedge accounting, but there are some key differences. For example, the measurement applies from inception of the exposure and it's for the whole of its life. It's not just for the designated hedged period. Also, the revaluation applies at the portfolio level. So it's the portfolio of hedged exposures that is the unit of measurement, not the individual items. So you can see it as an overlay adjustment to the normal accounting that would apply under IFRS 9. Hence, the usual recognition and measurement of assets and liabilities would be applied first before a revaluation adjustment is applied on top. With this type of model, the net impact in P&L shows the bank's remaining open risk position after hedging because it remeasures the whole portfolio managed for interest rate risk, not just the part that is actually hedged, because usually you can't identify that specifically. A consequence of this is that the larger the open position, the greater the volatility that is presented, even if the entity in intentionally has not hedged the whole portfolio. Now, the ISB's view on this is that this results in more transparent and meaningful information about the entity's risk management. As an alternative to this, the discussion paper does consider narrowing the application to subsets of the overall portfolio. For example, to specific sub-portfolios or proportions of portfolios, bottom layer portions, portfolios based on risk limits,
These are just some of the things they mention in the paper. But it does also acknowledge these alternatives, which will be appealing for those who want to limit the P&L volatility, would introduce operational complexities compared to the whole portfolio revaluation approach, which might reintroduce the same very issues that the revaluation model is trying to address. Now, because it is the whole portfolio of exposures that is the unit of measurement, that portfolio is measured after taking into account portfolio behaviours. For example, where the hedged portfolio includes prepayable mortgages, they would be measured based on expected cash flows rather than contractual cash flows. This has some similarities with the macro model in IS39, where prepayable loans are eligible hedged items. However, what's different is that the discussion paper contemplates including other exposures that on their own wouldn't be eligible for hedge accounting. For example, it considers whether core demand deposits, pipeline transactions, and the equity model book should be included. I won't go into the detail on, detail on these now, as I probably won't explain it as well as the discussion paper does. So for those not familiar with these concepts, I'd suggest taking a look at the discussion paper. So practically speaking, how would the portfolio get remeasured for interest rate risk? Well, the concept of the measurement is pretty straightforward in that the managed exposures are revalued based on a simple present value where the expected cash flows of the portfolio are discounted by the managed rate. Both expected cash flows of the portfolio and the discount rate are then updated for changes, which is what gives rise to a gain or loss recognised in profit or loss. This is the revaluation adjustment, which will then, to some extent, offset the change in fair value of the hedging instruments. So it's quite a simple concept, but like all simple concepts, it can throw up some challenges in practice. For example, which changes in interest rates should the portfolio be remeasured for when there are different benchmark rates that are hedged? Should it be three-month LIBOR, six-month LIBOR, OIS? Also, how representative is the model when interest rate risk transferred to the trading desk is not fully backed out with external derivatives? In other words, where derivatives held with external counterparties represents a mix of trading and hedging activity. Also, which expected cash flows should be included in the model and how would changes in management's expectations be dealt with to ensure transparency? These issues are explored further in the discussion paper. Now, one thing they suggest is to make the identification and measurement of cash flows of the portfolio more operational, the paper considers using transfer pricing mechanisms that are used within banks to transfer risk and internal funding between the business units and ALM. This could make it easier to identify the cash flows to be discounted and the discount rates to be applied. For example, transfer pricing could be used to measure the core demand deposit. The implicit fixed rate risk in this is typically included in ALM using a series of transfer pricing deposit deals which could be used to measure the identified core element of the demand deposit portfolio. Now there's quite a bit of discussion around this to gauge whether this would help a revaluation model become operational and reflective of risk management. So it's worth a read. So if this revaluation model doesn't involve hedge designations, is it like another business model where the revaluation is mandatory? Well, this is one of the questions asked in the discussion paper. Now, nothing is concrete in this model yet, so as, as part of its development, the paper considers the pros and cons of making it compulsory or optional, which makes for some quite interesting reading. For example, if a free choice is given, an entity could choose between not applying hedge accounting or the portfolio revaluation model, and so just go with the default IFRS 9 hedge accounting with no adjustments, or it could apply the general hedge accounting model to reduce P&L volatility, or thirdly, it could apply the portfolio revaluation approach for the whole portfolio. Now, if the portfolio approach was developed to apply to sub-portfolios instead of the whole thing, this is where it could get really interesting, as entities would have the choice to mix and match and apply hedge accounting for some sub-portfolios and a revaluation approach for others. So this would suit those focused on reducing profit or loss volatility from hedging activities, but then could also make it harder to compare the results of reporters. Also, if there's optionality, then they'll have to consider whether it could be voluntarily discontinued and how the amortisation and tracking of past revaluation adjustments would work in those cases.
So you can see that the starting position and concept behind this model is really quite simple, but things can get very complicated very quickly. This is where the ISB will be looking for practical insights and suggestions. Are there any other aspects of the discussion paper worth mentioning before we draw to a close? Well, the discussion paper is pretty comprehensive and it goes into various aspects of the model. Now, one thing to mention here, I guess, is where it talks about internal derivatives. It goes into quite some detail on how to deal with the fact that internal derivatives are often used to manage interest rate risk by transferring it to the trading desk and how to use internal derivatives to present meaningful information. So it goes into this. It also links this into different ideas on presenting the revaluation adjustment on the balance sheet and considers two or three different ways of doing that um, and also considers how to present gains and losses in profit or loss and where to show those gains and losses. The paper also considers disclosures that should accompany such a model. Now the final thing to mention here is that the paper briefly considers an alternative model where gains and losses are matched in other comprehensive income rather than in profit or loss. But it does note that if they were to go down this route, there'd be a number of unresolved issues that could be thrown up from this. So for example, what would you do with a revaluation adjustment recognised in OCI associated with assets or liabilities that are subsequently de-recognised? So they would have to think about that in more detail. Now finally, as I mentioned at the outset, the ISB is looking to get further insight on dynamic hedging strategies that exist in other industries and for other risks like FX risk and commodity risk. So there is some discussion around what would be relevant for non-financial corporates to consider. Kush, it sounds like there's a lot to digest in this discussion paper. How long will people have to respond and what will be the next steps? Well, those who want to respond have six months to provide any feedback. And once the comment period is over, the ISB will start their discussions again. So if all goes to plan, the next stage will be an exposure draft with some firmer proposals. But that still feels quite a long way off, so we'll have to wait and see how things develop from here. A complex discussion paper well explained. Kush Patel, thank you very much indeed.